right, welcome everyone back to another edition episode of the PR Style Guide podcast. We are so excited to be here with you, building community with women in the PR, comms, and marketing industry. I'm your host, Danielle Williams, and I'm so excited to be here with my co-host, Robin, as well as our phenomenal guests for this episode. I want to say this evening. Y'all can be listening to this any time of the day. So whenever you're listening to it, whether you're on the treadmill, whether you're in the car, um, again, we're grateful for you being here with us. So before we dive into today's episode, we want to make sure that we hit on a couple of different things. So as we're building our community, we want you to get connected to our email list. So we have some great things that we're cooking up for you, um, whether it is our first thing that we're excited to introduce is our 10 steps to a winning pitch. So in this world of PR and comms, we know that we want our media um, hits to get, well, we know that we want to be seen in the media. And so we're excited to provide this for you all. Um, and so make sure that you go over to the prstyleguide.com to click on those resources for our 10 steps to a winning pitch and sign up for our email newsletter. So with that being said, I'm going to throw it over to my co-host, Robin, to kick us off for today. Hello, I'm Robin Newton, as Danielle mentioned, and I'm so excited because tonight we have Samantha McCoy joining us. Samantha is the founder and CEO of Mission Key Communications, LLC. Her company transforms organizations and individuals into visibility magnets, who attract their ideal audiences through the power of public relations and personal brand branding. Doesn't that sound amazing? <laughs> Samantha has over 15 years of experience in communications and loves to amplify the stories of innovation and transformative industry leaders. Samantha loves to travel, like me, and spend quality time with friends, you can usually find her on the go with a warm cup of chai tea. Samantha, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin and Danielle. I'm so excited to be here. Well, we are excited to have you and we're going to kick it off with our favorite question. I think I, I say I speak for Danielle, too, but I think this is both of our favorite question, um, only because it came from one of the greatest movies, uh, Brown Sugar style with when did you fall in love with PR? <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yes. Uh, Brown Sugar is one of my favorite movies, so definitely love that reference. When did I fall in love with PR? Well, it's really funny because I did not know what PR was until I got my first PR job. <laughs> so I applied for a role as a communication specialist at a museum in Baltimore. And really, I read the description, sounded like something that I could do. And honestly, I really think that I got through the interview because of my writing skills and my speaking skills. But the media part, I learned on the job. <laughs> so um, one of the things that really connected me to, um, to the public relations piece is really just understanding the impact that you can make on the news that happens every day. I think that I'm a little bit different probably than a lot of individuals who get into public relations because I don't consider myself a news junkie. Even to this day, I'm very selective about what I consume, what I read, what I watch, what I listen to. I don't have the news on 24-7. And so what attracted me, though, to public relations and, and specifically the media side, because public relations is more than that. That's another conversation. But what attracted me to the media relations side of it is just the impact that you can make on actually pitching stories to journalists and actually influencing what's going to be on the news that day. And so I used to think, oh my goodness, the news is so depressing. It's discouraging. There's almost so much negativity. There's crime, there's shootings, there's you know all the disasters happening. But once I realized that I could introduce things into the news, introduce topics, introduce experts, introduce stories, that was something that immediately intrigued me. And I really think I got hooked onto that ability to, to share and get those stories in the news. That's so cool. So, so you learned on the job. How, how did you do this? 
<laughs> Did you have someone who was training you? Were you reading different pieces that kind of taught you? Were, were you Googling? What was going on, girl? <laughs> Right. Yeah, it was, it was a little bit of everything. So I was part of a team of two. And so uh, the director of communications at the time, she definitely trained me um, along the way. But I also learned most of it on my own. So I was Googling, I was researching. And this is really before there was as many resources as there are now. So there were not as many. So a lot of learning I had to do in person, going to workshops, um, going to trainings, going to TV studios and workshops, and just connecting with other people who were in my industry at the time. And so a lot of things I learned by trial and error. <laughs> I learned what journalists like, what they prefer, what they don't like. Uh, so a lot of the things that I did learn by trial and error, but it was just a combination of, you know, really just being curious, researching, paying attention, talking with different individuals, networking. And that was how, that was how I learned. So Samantha, you and I actually, we have some similarities in common. I'm really, I'm loving this. So when you say the job was a communication specialist, is that right? Yes, but PR mm -hmm. is actually more of a niche area with income. So was the job communication specialist? And then once you got in there, it really was PR or it, did you kind of just, yeah. Right. So, so communication specialist, it really covered, we did both public relations and marketing as okay. well. And back then social media was really just getting off the ground. So all those, those elements were new. So it was a combination of public relations and marketing, but a lot of it, because the museum did a lot of events, it was very uh, media relations heavy. So that was where that part came in. And we also wound up getting involved in some crisis as crisis management as well. And just because of different things that were going on in the institution at the time, you know, from a financial perspective, you know, nonprofits and fundraising and all that stuff. Sometimes you can you can have reporters have questions about, you know, the funding dipped a little bit. What's going on? So we had a little bit of, of all of that. So I think they gave it the title communication specialist just because of the breadth of everything that that the position involved. But um, for me, the probably the piece that I enjoyed most and also was the most challenging was the the media relations and and PR side, but that definitely laid the foundation uh, for for what I would go on to do in the future. Nice, I love that. Also, we both love chai tea. I just want to make sure. Yes, I that yes. I thought we <laughs> talked about that previously. We, we have do. Yeah, I yeah. love a good chai tea. Yes. All right, so let's dive into our next question, Samantha. So what's one fashion staple for you being a woman in this industry? Oh, fashion staple. <laughs> so I don't really consider myself like a fashionista necessarily. Like I'm not really into brands and all that, but I do think that over the years I've developed a particular style so one thing that I like, I actually really like heels a lot. They don't always like me, but <laughs> typically when I am, you know, in the office or um, in a environment, like any type of networking event or anything like that, I just really love the feeling of heels. So usually whatever outfit I have on, um, even if I'm wearing jeans, like I'll usually try to put on a fun heel. So I think that's a that's a fashion statement I really fashion piece I really enjoyed. Absolutely. So um your heels are, do you do color prints or are you kind of like a you have like a classic kind of I'm sick with what's your vibe? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. So I actually prefer colors and prints, but I probably wear more of the classic because it's what I find most. So, yeah. so but if I could find more funky colors and prints, I I would definitely do that. Gotcha. Danielle has a good heel game too. <laughs> Yeah, oh, awesome. I love you gotta heels. compare some brands because what I'm looking for now is now since you know. I guess my feet are maturing, you know. <laughs> I like that word. Like doing the same brands that I did in years previously. So 
I am now looking for that, that style comfort combination. Yes. I feel you. And I like that word. Um, you said mature in your feet. Of mature. Yes. yes. I, I've never thought of it that way, but I, I like that. I'm, I'm going to take that from you, Samantha. <laughs> But um, I don't. As you get older, also I have two small kids, four and two. So my days of I, my heels used to be my tennis shoes, but now I'm incorporating more more tennis shoes or more cute. I'm getting right. back to the heels though. But yes, the the feet maturing is a thing too because I used to be able to walk around them things all the time. Now it's like let me do it for this meeting, and then when I mm-hmm. go, set these things off. And let me pull the other shoes out the bag as I'm okay. walking back to my car. <laughs> okay. And no shame in my game. Like, yep, yeah, we, we went ahead and retired those. It was for right. <laughs> I yeah. was at an event just a few days ago, and a woman at the event had on this gorgeous green pantsuit. And she had on a pair of cute Chanel sneakers. And I was like, see, that is my jam these days. I need that. <laughs> <laughs> and she looks so cute and it was a professional event and she walks in there looking like a million bucks and it, for me I was drawn to the sneakers more so than everyone else who's walking around with heels on so even though our feet are maturing there are options yeah <laughs> and speaking Listen, of, I need to, oh uh, go ahead Danielle well I was just gonna say speaking of I feel like it's a whole thing happening with pants like pantsuits and cute sneakers like I'm seeing it and I love it I was actually literally just asking some friends yesterday I've never really been into like the Nike dunks and like tennis shoes I'm like y'all like can y'all help me out I'm only always in heels I'm trying to like up my my tennis shoe game like help yes me, <laughs> that me was too that's what I was gonna say Danielle because one of the reasons I wear heels is because I feel comfortable I feel confident because I'm like okay at least I know I can't go wrong but right. I feel like when you're an adult and you're wearing sneakers, you kind of have to know what to do. And I don't know what to do. <laughs> Same here. I went to my first sneaker event. It was sneaker con over the summer with two girlfriends of mine who are sneaker heads. And they were like, okay, this shoe is that, that shoe is that, that. And I'm just like, oh, I want the pink and white ones. Right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the name of them. Don't care. They're cute. Give me those. <laughs> now, I will say they do have some cute ones. So I am pretty excited. While I love me some heels, I'm pretty excited to venture into uh, these these sneakers. So, yeah. Well, Danielle, you have to keep me posted. Send me some some IG uh, messages or something so I can so I can follow along. I will. We we gonna have to help each other out. We were both exploring. So I love I love this for us. <laughs> So Sam, let's talk about how you started your business. I am so impressed with everything that you have going on. So what led you to start it? How'd you get started? What were the challenges? Talk to us about that. Yeah, so the uh, my first job as the communication specialist, I actually wound up turning them into my first client. So um, as I learned along the way, I got confident and comfortable with media pitching and writing and doing a lot of different things um, in public relations. And I said, you know, I wonder if I can do this on my own. I think I can. And it was interesting because uh, the the museum had a lot of different organizational uh, shifts internally. And I actually wound up uh, leaving to pursue some other opportunities and they wound up calling me back and saying, hey, Samantha, we miss you. We need you to come back. What are you doing right now? And, <laughs> and at that point, I was just kind of, you know, off starting to explore, you know, entrepreneurship. And I said, well, I don't really want to come back into the office like as an employee, but I would be more than happy to consult and, you know, continue to provide services in that way. And they said, yes, like, what do we need to do to make this work? And so they actually became my first client. And so that they really launched my, my business. And that's how I got started. That is awesome. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Way to leverage uh, someone in demand and need. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. I want to go back to, and 
so you said that you apply for a communication specialist, but what is your background? Um, did you cover that? Like, what's your degree in? Is that it? Right. If this is your first job, like NPR, like take right. us back. No, I did not talk about my background. So actually, Robin and I went to school together. We went to undergrad nice. together. Uh, we both went to Elon University. And um, now people know what it is. But when we went, nobody knew what it was. <laughs> but <laughs> But uh, it is a school, a liberal arts school in uh, North Carolina, and I'm known for its amazing uh, communications program. And so um, I actually studied back then what was corporate communications. I don't think that major even exists now, so I'm dating myself a little bit. But um, that is what I studied in school. And it's interesting because I only had one public relations course in at when I was at Elon. And to show how <laughs> disconnected from reality I was, we had case studies in this public relations course. And I thought all the company names were made up. <laughs> and it wasn't until like, <laughs> years later after I was like, oh, these companies are real. Like I just had no. <laughs> doing the scenarios and I was like oh this sounds real like a crisis you know we had crisis scenarios and all that stuff and I was just like these cases can't be real like they must be made up because they were just all over the place so that was how disconnected from corporate life I was um at the time but um, I went to school I went and studied uh, communications at Elon and then, you know, definitely just continue to be interested in, in the, in the major and in the specialty. And I actually, my first job out of school, um, so the communication specialist was my second job. So my first job out of school was actually as a nonprofit um, consultant. And um, I found that also through some mutual um, Elon connections. And um, I thought I was going to stay there and, but then I just wound up, you know, just really wanting to do a little bit more in communications than I was doing at that job and also in a different way. So that was when I applied for the communication specialist position. But my background has always been in uh, communications. And, you know, even though I wasn't necessarily as familiar with the corporate world, just because, you know, my family was not, neither one of my, my parents were in corporate. And so I just wasn't really in that realm. But I was always attracted to uh, reading, writing, speaking. So uh, my mom said that I started reading when I was two years old. And so um, she has recordings. They're probably not, I probably can't listen to them now because they're, they're so um, back in the day. But um, she has recordings of me uh, reading when I was two years old. I was uh, writing and and I'm always into storytelling. I remember I used to have journals and notebooks of stories and plays and illustrations and different things that I had um, growing up. And I remember the library was one of my favorite places to go on weekends. I loved books. I loved the smell of books. Like, you know, even like those old books, like I loved it. I thought it was the, the greatest thing. So I've always been into reading, writing, speaking. Um, my mom said I always used to talk to her friends on the phone, like <laughs> grown adults. And I'm a toddler I'm, or like four or five years old talking to grown women on the phone about who knows what. But um, I, that was something I always enjoyed doing. So all forms of communication, I've always loved and always been, been drawn and attracted to them. Um, and so I think that, that love has just followed me um, growing up and until now. Wow. Well, I really appreciate hearing that. So um, at least, so you're in, you were in the right space. You were in the communications space. So I work in PR as well in comms, but my degree is in psychology. My undergrad is in psychology and my master's is in organizational management and development, development. but I've always had communications internships or just like been in that space in front of the camera. So it just, I had a natural draw. And I also, um, once I graduated from grad school, worked in a nonprofit space. I helped them to launch their comms and marketing department. But I really have found my sweet spot like in the PR space. So working with radio, media. Um, but again, that's not my background, but just a love for it. And like you said, just kind of diving in and taking classes and things. And I feel like when you have a a natural love for something, you know, it doesn't feel like work or you just kind of 
once you're in, it's like, yeah, this is my sweet spot. You know, you figured it out. So, um, but yeah, just hearing your story is super inspiring. So I'm really, um, yeah, thank you for sharing. No, that's awesome. It's so funny. So my minor was psychology and I was actually going back and forth between corporate communications and psychology. And the what what made the, the tipping point for me is um, when I was in psychology and learned that we had to take research methods if I wanted it to be my major. And I said, you know, I think I'm going to skip that. So, <laughs> so I did everything except for research methods. That is funny. It's so funny. Like now being a psychology major, I loved research. I love writing. So I feel like it's still some of the same elements of PR because you have to do research, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, yeah. So I I appreciate still having that background and I'm able to really, you know, hone it. And I love the media pitching part. I love that. So it's like, okay, this is still a good, it it still makes sense. Right. Stuff. It's all in there. And you have to know about a little bit of psychology to to navigate the, the realm of people and, and communicating. So. Right. So, Sam, do you enjoy working for individual clients over working for a company? You know, I was thinking about that and I really enjoy a little bit of both. So I think on the individual side, I really enjoy working with, and when I'm saying individuals, I'm thinking of people who are, who want to promote themselves and their personal brands. And so I think the, the pleasure of working and in getting their story out and increasing their visibility is a lot of times I'm able to introduce them to platforms and share their stories on platforms that they may not have been able to get access to up to that point in their career. So maybe they have done a little bit of media here and there, but there may be other platforms where they're looking to grow and expand and they just don't have any way of reaching those contacts or reaching that platform. And so the excitement of being able to do that is is really, really gratifying. Um, On the corporate side and the organizational side um, and nonprofits, because we work with um, nonprofits as well through my business, is that just being able to tell the multifaceted layers of the story. Because with an organization, there is the organizational story and bringing the humanity to the business and to the industry. And then there's also the side of telling the story of the people inside the organization and and not just the CEO, not just the directors, but also the the employees, the uh, people who may patronize that business, so just doing all of the different layers that come into working with an organization. Um, a lot of times they may put on events for the community or give back to the community in some way. So there's so many different layers and different angles to tell stories when it comes to an organizational perspective. So I like a little bit of both. What's the most challenging thing about working in PR? Hmm, the most challenging I would say for me, it is the unpredictability. And it's interesting because that's the challenge, but then that's also what makes it exciting. But on the challenging side for me, I like things to kind of be buttoned up and resolved and finished because I just just like the satisfaction of, yes, that's done, let's move on. But in public relations, as you both know, a lot of times you may think something is resolved or you may think you have, you know, something finalized and then something pops up. Oh, we have to move this. So it could be on the media side. Hey, the media was going to come here at, you know, 10 a.m. Now they need to come at 6 a.m. And now your whole schedule has to adjust. Everything has to adjust. If you have team members, they have to adjust because, you know, the media, you have to work on their timetable. Then another thing as far as, you know, working with events. So there may be certain events that you think certain things were going to go in a certain way. And then you have to change course in the moment. There may be a spokesperson who was supposed to come and speak in an organization and that moment happens and the CEO is not available or the executive director is not available. Hey, Samantha, can you step in? Hey, Samantha, can you be live on television right now? That's happened to me before (laughs) because, you know, I need you to step in and jump in. So a lot of times that unpredictability, that is the exciting part, but also it can be the challenge because you always have to be ready 
for what you don't know could happen. So that anticipation and, and preparation, you can never be be too prepared. Absolutely. So pretty much you always come to, I mean, if it's an event, of course you come dressed and ready, but it's like, you're always ready and on yes. your game to be able to jump in when needed. Exactly. Yes. Well, we can both attest to that. We've been there <laughs> when things are just like, oh, no, nothing's going right today. That's okay, though. <laughs> and one of the cool things about being in PR, though, especially from the point that from the standpoint that you're on, the side of things that you're on, you have helped usually that client or that organization tailor those talking points. So you are prepared to step in at any moment because you're the one who already set it up. <laughs> no, that that is so true. And and one of the things that I really value and have come to value and, and share with clients all the time is the importance of that preparation. Because sometimes, especially people who are comfortable in front of the camera or comfortable speaking, Sometimes it's easy to want to skip that part because they'll say, oh, I've done this before. I do this all the time. I don't need talking points. I don't need, you know, tips. I don't need prep. But it's so important to go through that process because it's not just for you, but it's also if you had to hand it off to a team member or someone else, you know, in a moment, you want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. And even from an organizational standpoint, you want to make sure that you're very clear on your key messaging so that no matter who in your leadership team the media is speaking to, you're all saying the same thing and all speaking the same language. So I was actually going to ask you a question. Speaking of preparation, so what does a week in the life, a, I'm not going to say a day in the life, but specifically when it comes to like systems that you use, um, again, I know you're researching talking points, you know, just a, a little, especially because you own your own, um, your own age or your own company. So I would love mm -hmm. to just know kind of like, what are your systems and approaching working with clients? Yeah, I would definitely say um, in the preparation process, we house everything really through Google. So Google Doc is kind of our, our home for all of our clients. And um, what we do is we actually set up folders as research folders. So we have documents that we use as background documents. So we will pull together um, fact sheets. So if they don't have them, we'll have put together fact sheets on who the organization is or who the individual is and key things that we want to make sure that the public knows. Any stats in the industry, any uh, wins that the companies have or any wins that the individuals have, we are always updating and keeping that fact sheet up to date with all of that information. And then we also put together a photo. So we make sure that there are professional headshots. So professional headshots of the spokespeople, professional headshots, um, professional headshots of events or different things that the company may have had going on or the individual may have had going on. And um, also anything that may be coming up. So we have all of these things as background. And then also uh, we, our team, uh, we are always researching on the industry and different things that are happening within the industry. So we set up Google alerts on the industry. We set up Google alerts on that company or on that individual. And we're always monitoring the news to see, okay, what's happening in the news right now? So even though, like I said earlier, I'm not, I don't consider myself a news junkie but when I have something laser to focus on, I'll say, okay, yes, anytime I'm in the, looking for this and I'm seeing this in the news, now I'm looking and honing in on, okay, I'm looking for this particular in issue so that if it's something that my client can speak to, we're ready to go. So those are all the different things that we have going on in the background. And um, we also use um, different research tools to uh, aggregate our media list. So um, for a long time, we've definitely done organic um, outreach <laughs> to, to media. Um, but in addition to our organic outreach, we do have um, different tools and, and resources that we use to, um, if there's contacts that we don't have when organically, that we can um, have access to those as well. Gotcha. So oh, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. 
Go ahead. You know, I have a lot of questions. Go, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to say mine. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to talk about social media because your social media is on point. I am so impressed. Seriously, your Instagram, your LinkedIn, I I, I love it. You provide great information. Um, you're always going live and doing these cute videos. And it's just not only is it an opportunity to promote your business, but you have a personal brand that you're honing as well. I love that. So I want to know as someone who is on social media trying to build my personal brand, um, how do you go about it? How do you come up with these great ideas? No, thank you so much, Robin, because it is definitely a work in progress. I am not uh, definitely not a guru on social, but I um, definitely have been a lot more intentional um, in just how I share and how I show up on there. So um, one of the things that that really helps me is I think about questions that clients ask me. I think about different questions that I hear. Even prospective clients may ask me on discovery calls or when they first meet me for the first time. And, you know, a lot of times people over the years, I've realized they ask me very similar questions. Or even when we're considering which clients and which organizations we want to work with, there are certain things that we look for that are ideal clients for us. So that's something else that helps me come up with certain topics is, you know, I want to make sure that when people know if they're looking and they're researching, they're following, that they know, okay, before you hire a PR agency, do you have these three things? Do you have these five things? You know, do you have a budget <laughs> that's more than $500 a month, right? So like <laughs> yeah, that sometimes people don't know. They, they really have no idea. And so I really like to use my social media platforms as opportunities to educate. So education is a very big uh, pillar for me on, on social. And I also try to lean into that strength because I definitely am not one of the, you know, video girlies. Like if I'm doing a video, it's probably because I'm just talking like I am right now. So I'm not really big on the whole production. I mean, I would love to at one point have a team that follows me around or, you know, all those things, but I'm not doing all that myself. So, um, so I just go ahead and lean into my, my strengths. So I use um, Canva, I use photos, I use carousels um, on LinkedIn. I, this year, I actually committed to doing about two articles every month. So, and I hit most months. I think there was a couple, maybe one or two months that I missed, but I'm um, definitely just leaning into the ways that I am comfortable and confident communicating and really leaning into that education piece. And that's really worked well. So awesome. I want to pause really quick because I know everybody's thinking it. So I know we normally give the socials at the end, but because we're talking about it, people are like, well, what's her social media? Let me go check her out now. So can you give that to the people really quick? Uh, <laughs> sure. My Instagram is Samantha Publicist. So S-A-M-A-N-T-H-A Publicist. And for those of you who will find me on IG, encouragement to those of you who don't have a lot of followers yet, I don't have a lot of followers. I am not an influencer, but people come to my social media. They learn, they connect with me. They ask about what I do, ask about my services, follow other platforms that I'm on. And it's definitely been such a, a rewarding thing. So do not do not be discouraged if you are just getting started or if you're like, okay, I started, but you know, I'm not really growing fast, going, growing, you know, as rapidly as I want to. You don't necessarily need to have all the followers. It's about having followers who want to follow your content and want to consume your content. And I don't, I need to remember this this uh, person's name, but there's someone who talks about having 1,000 true fans, right? So you want to build that 1,000 group of people who will follow whatever you're doing and buy whatever it is that you're rolling out because they're genuinely interested. Because what happens is a lot of times, and people won't tell you this, but a lot of times the people who have like 100 and 200,000 followers or a million followers, a lot of times a very small fraction of that audience is actually engaged with them on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So don't be discouraged by the numbers. The numbers will grow as they need to. 
but you just want to make sure you're continuing to provide that content. Um, like Robin was saying, I, I just really appreciate her, you know, even complimenting me on my social media because I'm like, woo, I got a long way to go. But you know, it's it it goes to show that it's not about the 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 followers and the number of followers. It's about what people value and what they learn from your content. So I've gotten so many opportunities, um, even with the following that I have, because people see the quality of the content that I'm putting out. So um, even if you're starting out, I encourage you to invest in, you know, graphics, invest in your photos. And it doesn't even have to be like, you know, super professional. Like all of my stuff doesn't look exactly the same. Sometimes I change it up different looks and I've tried different things over the years. Um, so you definitely don't have to have a very large budget, but you definitely want to put in that effort um, from the beginning so people can see that you're really serious about what you're doing. I Absolutely. Yeah, we appreciate that even just as we're getting started with the PR style guide, we are trying to curate um, not just an audience, but our brand and our colors and the theme so people um, can get accustomed to what they're coming to our page for. Um, and that's something that Danielle and I have spent a lot of time talking about and, and perfecting. Um, so we do hope that people see it, value it, and find, you know, find it something that um, they, 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 they uh, want to receive. Um, but we're also open to suggestions. So since yours is always so amazing, um, let us know if you have any ideas for us. We gladly take it. Will do. Will do. And following up on that, so it sounds like you have a team. So I was going to ask about um, is your social media some because I feel like sometimes people feel like I need to devote so much time to it or, um, you know, they may get overwhelmed by it. So it seems like you've been intentional about creating it or just, you know, getting it together because again, you're seeing the fruit of these opportunities of people coming to you. So does that look like you mentioned Canva, you mentioned good photos, but do you have a team that works on your agency things? And so that kind of gives you a little more time to focus on your personal or is it, you know, I'm doing both, but I'm just have pockets of time. I feel like that's a question that people have is, how are you doing it? You're doing it. Yes. Thank you. No, I am doing it right now. Um, so I do have a team, but my team is um, helps more on the publicity and media relations side. So um, usually my team members will help with um, various accounts that we have. So as far as the, the social side and um, all of that right now, I do typically handle that um, on my own. So um, one of the things that does help me is I do try to um, schedule different things kind of in, like, even though I'm posting it, I'm posting it live. So I don't have it like pre scheduled like that. But as far as the um, like templates that I use in Canva, I may have a whole sheet of, you know, maybe five or six posts that I may develop at one time. Um, and honestly, there are some days, some months and some weeks that are a little bit slower than others, a little more sporadic. So I'm still working on, still working on that. But I think the, the advantage that, that this crazy algorithm has had for me is that now people don't necessarily see your post on the day that you post it. So for me, I think that works in my advantage a little bit because even some of the weeks that are a little bit slower, people are still seeing posts from like maybe two weeks ago. And they're like, oh, Samantha, you're always on Instagram. And I'm like, I'm glad you think that. <laughs> but uh, so I think that's something that that's really helpful. Um, and then on LinkedIn, you can LinkedIn, I do schedule on um, those articles and, and post in advance. Um, and that's something that that really helps. But um, on the Instagram side, I definitely just try to, you know, do what I can when I have those moments of inspiration, those moments of, you know, or sometimes if I get really like irritated or annoyed and I'm just like, if one more person asks me this question, let me just make a whole bunch of posts about it. So <laughs> and when people reach out and ask the question, you just send them the social media link. Here you go. Here's one, two, and three. I've answered it already. I definitely do that for sure. But that brings up a good Maybe. point. That's the great thing about content. You know, that's the great, like when we create it, it is a resource for people. So we do have something to point people to 
that's then evergreen that's there you know and so again people can see it three six months you know however long later but we took the time to create it it's bringing us opportunities so i think um as robin said there's so much value in taking time for social media it doesn't have to be scary but you know and i think the there is a whole thing with micro communities you know you don't have to have this you know thousands or mil, you know, however many followers, but you can make great impact. Again, if you're serving people and bringing value, it sounds like you're doing that. So hats off to you. Thank you. Absolutely. We're going to shift gears a little bit because we like to do something called the lightning rounds. And in the lightning round, we give you um, two items or, or some of them actually have three. Um, and you tell us which one you prefer. Um, so I think we know the first one. So coffee or tea, you've already established you are a chai tea fan. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Mac or PC? Oh, that's a, that's a rough one. Okay. So I'm going to say Mac. But it's funny because it's kind of by force because <laughs> because I am naturally, I used to always be a PC person. And then I just had to, I started getting more and more Mac things. And so, <laughs> so now I'm, I'm converted. I'm, I'm converted over. So. Okay. You said that it's hard. I feel like most people like it's either or like it's a easy, but that's no, I got it. Yeah, I can I can dibble and dabble in, in both because there's there's things that I like about about both of them. So but right now I, I'm in I'm in Mac world. Okay. Early bird or night owl? Woo. I feel like either or is hard for me because I feel like I'm like the outlier. So I feel like I'm a midday person. But if I had to pick, I would definitely rather be up late than get up early, especially when it's cold. I can, mm -hmm. I can attest to that. So spring or fall? Mm, spring. That's a hard one, too, because I'm a summer girl because spring and fall be cold and I don't like it being cold. So I like fall until like mid-November. Then once it starts getting real cold, I'm over it. And I'm like, I need summer to be back. So I'll say fall-ish. Okay. <laughs> we'll take it. We'll take or it. Early fall, late spring. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I think I, with that being said, I know the answer to this one too. Um, beach or mountains? Clearly you're going with the beach. Right. For sure. Now that is 100%. 100%. <laughs> Black suit or blue suit? Mm, black suit. But I always put a statement piece on it. And what is that statement piece usually going to be other than your heels? Because we know you're going to come with a funky heel. Yes. Other than my heels, I would definitely say a necklace. Okay. Love that. All right. I feel like I know the answer to this one. Um, Instagram or Facebook? Instagram all day. Right. Twitter or TikTok? Ooh, can we say neither one? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So I'm not, I mean, I am on the X platform, uh, <laughs> honestly, because it helps me to be connected with journalists who are still on there. A lot of them have, have pivoted, but the ones who are still on there, um, it's a great resource for media pitching. TikTok, like I said, I'm not a video girly, so I feel like you have to really put some intentionality into TikTok posts, and I'm just, I'm just not there. So I may lurk on there from time to time to see what people are doing, talking about, but I don't have a TikTok right now. Thank you for that. We need to uh, update this to X. It is. We still have Twitter, but we, we got to update. Do. When we when we were writing these. Uh, lightning round questions it was still twitter so we do need to update these I mean, but can we can we briefly talk about that though are you finding that reporters have gone to threats more more reporters or the media well i actually found more reporters on linkedin so that has been mm -hmm. another form where i have found them so um it's a combination of between um twitter and um 
and LinkedIn. And that that's when I was talking about the organic media outreach before. It's usually been a combination of those two platforms that has really helped. Um, I've also found um, some some journalists on Instagram as well. Um, so it's it's kind of a little bit of of all of those three since mm-hmm. he's at on Twitter as much, but or X as much. But um, you know there still are a lot of uh, media and journalists who are still still on there. Um, for the same reasons that I said, you know, a lot of times they will use, you know, they'll still use those hashtags like journal request or, hey, I'm working on a story on this, you know, so so it's a little bit of, of both. So I, I have seen some um, journalists going away from X, but, you know, there also are still a lot who are are still maybe reluctantly, but they're still they're still on there. Samantha Jones or Olivia Pope? I was wondering if you were going to ask me that because I watched the other episode when you asked someone else that. You did your homework. So, so I'm so difficult because both of them, I'm like, really? Like both of them, both of the characters have things that make me go, really? But if I had to choose, I would say Olivia Pope because her dress is fierce. You can't, you just can't beat it. Yeah, she did come. I, I loved Olivia Pope's coats. Her yes. coat game was so... Mm, 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 mm. And I also would definitely say Olivia Pope, like her strategy game for the win. I just wasn't a fan of her personal life situation, but strategy for sure all day. Washington Post or New York Times? Man, these are hard. Okay, so <laughs> I feel like I have to say Washington Post because I'm in that DMV area. But then I also really like the way New York Times articles are too. So I guess if I have to say for the sake of the DMV, I'm going to hold it down with the post. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and you know you don't have to, but we're going to respect whatever answer you give us. Absolutely. We're going to do that. Listen, if there's any Washington Post journalists watching or listening, I don't want them coming for me. So <laughs> say less. Say less. Extrovert or introvert? Hmm. That's funny. I was thinking about this earlier today. So on the Myers Briggs test, I have <laughs> tested times as extrovert. However, comma, I feel that the adult version of me is like I am peopled out. And I'm going to bed. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that means. The test says I'm gonna eat, but isn't it like a percentage? Are you like fully like extra? Or are you kind of like on the you know? Yeah. So when I took this, because I I originally took it, I think in high school a couple times. So I probably should test it again because it was pretty high on the E back then. But I feel like now it is. Actually, I saw this on Instagram that it was a slide and it was basically like, you're a, what is, you're a extroverted introvert. Cause it was like, you like being around certain types of people, but the environment has to be curated. Right. <laughs> and it's, it's like, if you fall outside of this curated group of people, then I'm going to be on my phone and ready to go home. So I need one that's like extrovert, but I'm tired. So now I'm introvert. That's the real thing. Okay. Actually, it's the real thing. You know, that's that's probably also true because I know I operate on much less sleep than I should. So that could be it. I'm naturally an extrovert, but yeah, as as I've become more mature, I'm like, no, no, no. I'm I'm good with being in this house. <laughs> you gotta pick, pick your weekends, pick your days, can't you know, you gotta right. Yes. Absolutely. All Heels, right. flat, or tennis shoes. And I think we know the answer to that. Yeah, too. yeah, we we already said we already said heels. But I want to learn about the tennis shoe game though. Yes, well, we're gonna work on that together, Samantha. We're gonna work on that together. And before we close out, Samantha, we love to always close out with a little bit of um uplifting advice. Um, what is one tip or advice that someone has given you, um, that has stuck with you and, and helped you over the years that you'd like to share with us and you think could benefit any newbies in the PR space? 
Yes, I would definitely say a piece of advice that has stuck with me is when you walk into a room, walk in like you own the room. And it doesn't mean that you have to be cocky or arrogant about it, but you can be confident and assured that you belong in the room because people are attracted to confidence and you will be amazed at the opportunities that come to you just because you are secure in who you are and you know what you're bringing into the space. I love that. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Right. Period. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. Samantha. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's Rob. been a pleasure. This was so much fun. Yes. So you already gave us the places where we can follow you, um, which you said Samantha Publicist. Is that correct? Yes, that's my Instagram. And then my website, I don't think I said my company name, uh, but my uh, PR agency is Mission Key Communications. And our website is Mission, M-I-S-S-I-O-N, Key, K-E-Y, Communications with an S. And you can go there and it will also link to all of our other socials as well. And we also have a checklist out now called the Media Ready Checklist. So you can go there or go to my Instagram and download that. All right. Well, thank you that. again, Samantha. Make sure you all um, connect with Samantha and her agency. Get that checklist that she has. And also don't forget to like, share, subscribe to our podcast. And also please rate and review. And we cannot wait to see you all again for our next episode. Until then, I'm Danielle Williams. And my co-host. I'm Robin Newton. <laughs> all right. We will see you all for the next episode of the PR Star Guy podcast. Oh.